Hey everybody, we are continuing our study in the book of Ruth and what a blessing it's been. Um, yes, I missed Tuesday. It's been crazy, but Lord, we just ask that you would remind us that you see our situation, you care about our situation, and you're able to provide in our situation. Lord, and you provide yourself, Lord, you are the gift. Not so much your provision, but Lord, your presence is enough. We love you, we thank you. Bless this time in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm still doing the introduction to the book of Ruth, okay? There's just so much to introduce. So I'm just gonna continue to, to read. Um, but again, the book of Ruth beautifully illustrates God's work of salvation. I love this. Ruth, an outsider, a stranger, but she ends up as a member of the covenant community. She married um, a man who rescued her and redeemed her and provided for her and loved her. What a beautiful story. You know, you, you see these Disney stories and yeah, I think they copied from the Bible. I think they really did. The Cinderella story, the Snow White story. Um, everybody wants a Prince Charming and that only happens in the Bible. Only happy endings happen in the Bible. But anyway, um, so I love this. She's far now she's near. But the book of Ruth, again, is like our relationship with God as it progresses, as it progresses. In Ruth, um, chapter one, Ruth doesn't even know Boaz exists. Chapter one, Ruth does not even know Boaz exists. And then in chapter two, she's just a poor gleaner, gleaning in the fields of Boaz and receiving his gifts. And to her, Boaz is only a man of wealth. She really doesn't even know him. She just knows that I'm gleaning in this man's field. And then chapter three, she pursues him and submits to his care and provision. She submits to his care and provision. And then chapter four, again, no longer a gleaner, but a joint heir. Everything Boaz owns, she owns. Wow, how amazing is that? Um, you know, sad how the, how the prodigal son, the older son, didn't really rejoice. Everything he had was the father's, but oh, he was living in envy. He was living in unthankfulness, living in unbitterness. But just sometimes that's us. We have so many things to be thankful for, and yet we are just not content. We have a bitter, angry spirit. So, son, all that I own is yours. We, have, we are joint heirs with Christ. Okay, but again, are we content to live in chapter two? picking up leftovers and just surviving, okay? Are we content to just live on leftovers and just surviving? Do we want God's gifts, but not him the gift? You know, it, it takes us a while to figure out the prodigal son, the best gift was the father. I don't care about the money, I spent it all anyway and it didn't satisfy me anyway. The gift was the father. Okay, the gift was the father. And um, yeah, would we rather have, <laughs> you know, our loved ones who are gone to heaven? Would we want their stuff? Would we want their things? <laughs> no, we would want them. We want them. When you have Jesus, you have everything. You really do. When you have Jesus, you, he is the gift. How we need to get to focus on Jesus, the gift, instead of the gifts. Okay, they're just secondary. Okay, whatever you need, Jesus will give you, but he is the gift. Um, okay, all the things you may desire cannot compare with Jesus. Oh, I love that in Proverbs chapter, chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8 just lists all the beautiful things that you have when you get wisdom. And you could, again, put Jesus' name where wisdom is. Everything you need comes and is fulfilled and is provided for. When you have Christ, you don't need to look anywhere else. Again, when the prodigal son came home, did he need anything? No, he had the father. He had everything he needed. Okay. Um, who has hardened himself against God and, and prospered? Who has hardened himself against God and prospered? Nobody. It never ends well when we disobey God. It never ends well when we turn our own way. You know, the smartest, what's the smartest prayer in the Bible or the smartest words in the Bible? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, your will be done. 
and the, the dumbest, most foolish, I think most painful thing that we pray is, yeah, my will. I want my will to be done. And our will never ends out good. I don't think wherever Frank Sinatra is, I don't think he's singing, I did it my way and is happy about it. I think people are going to regret, oh, I wished I had gone God's way. Can you imagine that? When you get to heaven, you will have zero regrets. The only thing you'll regret is why didn't I serve God more? Why did I spend so much time on this? Thing? Why did I waste so much time? Why? But we will never regret, regret when we give everything over to the Lord. Um, when we obey, things come together. And when we disobey, things fall apart. And I love this. How do you spell joy? Just our yieldedness just our yieldedness j-o-y i love that okay the lives of naomi and elimelech again and orpa are a perfect example bad decision ended up in three funerals a bad decision ended up in three funerals we are going to see many mistakes that they made um, unbelief bad decisions deception and bitterness and the one thing I want to just point out again is Elimelech's unbelief. You know, no king, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. The book of Judges is just that book. Um, no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. And what a disaster. Judges, again, is the story at the low of Israel at the lowest point. At the lowest point in history. <laughs> when we sometimes are in Israel and we're driving down to the Dead Sea. Lloyd will get, stop, grab the microphone, and he'll say, folks, I'm at the lowest point in my life right now. And everybody's like, oh, what's wrong with Pastor Lloyd? He said, we're at the Dead Sea, and this is the lowest in elevation that we will ever be. Anyway, but it was a low point in history, okay? Division, cruelty, apostasy, civil war, national disgrace. Does it sound familiar? My goodness, things don't change. And again, what cycle are we in? What cycle are we in? I think we're in a pretty bad cycle. I think we're almost in bondage at this point. You know how the Lord, you know, blesses them and then they prosper, but then they forget God and then they get into bondage and they, then they cry, then they're miserable. Then they cry out to God. You know, where where are we? You know, sometimes the Lord gives us just enough trials so that we have to cling to the Lord. I love what David said, Lord, don't give me neither poverty or riches. Don't give me poverty that I forget you and curse you. And don't give me riches that I forget you. How hard it is for people to cry out to the Lord when they have everything they need, their bank account's full and everything's going good. But when things are tough, we cry out to the Lord. So what cycle are we in? And God help our country. I pray for our country all the time. Oh, how we need a revival. We are we are going down. We are going down big time. We've cursed God. We've killed so many babies. It's just we're under the curse of God. He can't really bless America. How we need to be salt and light in our country. Anyway, all the fruits, or the, I'll call them thorns of disobedience. You know, they're seeing that. Ruth is the rose among the thorns. <laughs> Ruth is the rose among the thorns. The sweet in the bitter, the light in the darkness. Oh, I love that little spot in the Passover meal. You know, there's always the honey and the sweet. When life is bitter, there's still the, the sweetness. There's all, Jesus will just put enough sweetness in our life to keep us going. He doesn't want us in that constant bitterness. Okay, again, light in the darkness. Today in our rebellious, godless world, God is calling a wooing, a bride, or speaking comfortably to us. He says, come, come and sit at my table. Come, I've provided for you. Come, I've got all this delicious food for you to eat. Um, read Proverbs 8 and 9. I love how it just talks about, uh, I've set my table. Let me just read you. Got to re read a few scriptures here. Proverbs 8 and nine. I know I've read that in another. Um, Therefore, children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates. 
waiting for the post of my doors. We're always doing that on social media. We always have time for our phones. We always have time to check out the latest on Facebook or that. Of course we have time. If you counted how much you scroll, you could have read the, the Bible probably five times. <laughs> anyway, we do have time. But watching and waiting for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. Chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent her maidens out. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine which I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live, and go in the way of understanding. And he who reproves a scoffer gets shame for himself and he who rebukes a wicked man gets himself a blemish do not repro reprove a scoffer lest he hate you rebuke a wise man and he will love you but give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser still and the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom anyway you just get the picture jesus is calling us constantly and we can either drop everything we're doing and come and sit or we can reject it um, Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God so loved the world, what that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What Again, what a beautiful love story Ruth is. The book of Ruth also is a harvest story as well as a love story. During this dark time, God was seeking a bride and reaping a harvest. <laughs> okay, and Isaiah chapter 5 just talks about, it's such a beautiful piece of scripture. This says, what more could I have done for this little garden? I came looking for fruit. I got the best fertilizer. I got miracle Grow. I took out all the weeds. I took out all the rocks. I got bug spray. And he's waiting for the harvest and there's nothing. That's what God says to us. Sometimes we think, God, if you'd have done this, God, if you'd have done that, God, if you'd have given me a different husband, God, if you'd have given me a different location. We do that a lot, don't we? Or this, if this hadn't happened. But he says in Isaiah chapter five, read it today. What more could I have done for you? I did everything that I could do and yet there's no fruit in your life. Wow. Just know that Jesus has done everything that he could do for you, okay? You should be loaded with fruit. And you know what? When you do doubt God's love for you, look at the cross. Look at the cross. If you're the only one, he would have gone all the way to the cross. And I'll tell you what, we're so good at making excuses. Again, if Jesus, if you had done this or hadn't done that, no, we really have no excuse. You know, Galatians 6 says, you reap what you sow, God will not be mocked. You reap what you sow, God will not be mocked. What are you reaping today? What are you sowing today? Okay. Your harvest is cropping up because of what you sowed last year. It's scary to think about, isn't it? Or the fruit you have is because, I love it when people say, I started reading my Bible and I'm a different person. My husband doesn't recognize me. How cool is that? You will be changed when God when you get the word of God into you. Um, we see Ruth and Naomi bearing fruit. I love that. From brokenness and obedience. Brokenness and obedience always will bring fruit, okay? And again, look around. The harvest is ripe and ready. Look around. There's people that are hungry for God everywhere. Um, and it's so funny. Where does this take place, this book? Um, how strange it's in a famine in the household of bread <laughs> a famine in the household of bread that's interesting in the Old Testament a famine represents God's discipline and judgment when you read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 29 something like that 26 anyway the 26 is of Leviticus and Deuteronomy it's incredible it's incredible um, your field will be blessed, your children will be blessed, your household will be blessed, your business will be blessed. When you follow me, you will be blessed beyond measure to where you can't even contain it. And then 
vice versa, the curses apply. When you don't follow me, your ground will be dried up. You'll have no crops. You'll have no family. You have no business. I mean, it's just the kiss of death, you know? When you don't follow the Lord, curses abound. But you know what I love? Just a reminder, Jesus took our curse. What did they put on his head? Crown of thorns. Thorn is a curse, a flower that didn't develop. Anyway, um, oh, I'll tell you what's the most sad thing, a famine of the word of God. I just heard a statistic, 37% of pastors um, are teaching the Bible. Where The rest are gone woke, progressive, ripping out parts of the Bible. Oh God, help us. Do you know that's why the Jesus movement exploded? Chuck just didn't sit there and have just entertainment or feel good messages. No, he said the word of God. And there's my beloved out in the yard. Um, Chuck Smith did not compromise. He just gave the word of God. And look what happened. The power of the word of God. These men were changed. Oh my goodness. They came in dead and they left alive. Look at some of these some of these men that were changed by the Jesus movement. I know I'm one of them. I came in broken, worldly, and I, God just got a hold of my heart. Oh, I just those are some of my best memories. And oh Lord Jesus, thank you for rescuing me. Um, but again, people are desperate. They drive an hour to hear the teaching of the Word of God. How we need to get back to that. Um, and again, in Judges, the people repeatedly turned from God and worshipped idols. And I'm going to stop right here. And I always think of that. An idol just means vanity. Or just ever, ever be hungry and you eat a cotton candy? Ooh, there's nothing there. Or a rice cake. There's no substance. Idols. There's no substance. It's, it's, it's hands that can't help. Ears that can't hear. Nose that can't smell. Eyes that can't see. Um, I forget what chapter. It's in Psalms somewhere about worthless idols, dumb idols that can see nothing, do nothing, can't help. So are you looking to the Lord who can help, who sees, who has everything you need? Or are you looking to your worthless idol, whatever, whatever it might be? So just, again, just keep reading through the book of Ruth. Oh my goodness, it'll lift your spirits. And I hope just something ministered to you today. God bless you.